So, for the longest time in my teenage years, I earned a few bucks a week by doing babysitting work. It always made me giggle at how there are so many urban legends based around babysitting. The serial killer that stalks the unwitting teen, the call coming from inside the house, pretty much every Halloween movie in some manner that seems to present babysitting as the vocation of those with a death wish, when in reality, the only thing likely to kill you is the boredom. Sure, you get a bratty kid and it makes an evening a little more challenging, but you get a good one and you're basically sat on the couch for hours on end watching tedious cable TV shows and counting the minutes until the parents get home. Saying that, I did babysit for one family that ended in a frankly terrifying experience that ended up in me never, ever sitting for them ever again. It only happened once, but sometimes once is enough. So I arrive at this big old house a few blocks away from my parents' house at around 6.30 one Friday evening. The parents of the kid seem incredibly charming, and the kid is one of the more adorable little tykes that I've had the good fortune of minding. We go over a brief list of rules, what the kid is and isn't allowed to eat, how much I'll be paid and how long I'll be sitting for, and that sort of thing. Then the parents head out to whatever fancy party that they had been planning on tending. All goes well for a little while. The kid wouldn't eat their carrots, but when I pretended that they were delicious by taking little bites myself, they soon broke into a smile and pretty much demolished the little bowl of hummus that we were sharing. With the kid fed, I gave her a bath, tucked her into bed, and that's that. It was honestly one of the easier jobs I'd had, right up until the sun started to go down. So once the kid's asleep, I head downstairs to order a pizza on the parent's dollar. Like I said, they were perfectly nice and polite when we first met, and it's not often a job comes with free food. Pizza arrives pretty quickly, and I even tip the delivery guy a few dollars just to say thank you for being so fast. He's literally counting out the change in dollar bills when his head snaps to the side, like he's looking into the bushes at the side of the house. I ask him if everything is okay, peering out from the door to see what he's looking at. But there's nothing, just dark bushes. He says something along the lines of, oh, sorry, guess I'm just tired. Mine's playing tricks on me. He laughs awkwardly, then walks back to his car while thanking me again for the tip. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, it was probably just a cat or something, right? So we got back inside to eat, have a full-on carb overload, and end up just lying there on the couch watching TLC. There were these big bay windows in the family's TV room, and I had drawn the curtains earlier to block out the glare on the TV. Only I hadn't drawn them all the way, and there was a slight crack in the curtains that allowed me to see into the dark front yard. At one point, my eyes were drawn to this little crack, and I could swear I saw a dark shape where street lights were previously visible. I sit up, focusing my eyes on the shape and wondering if it were my mind playing tricks on me this time when it moved. I wasn't going nuts. I had been looking at someone or something who was in turn looking at me through the big old windows. That's about when I started to freak out. I had been super chilled all evening, but now I was getting that distinctly paranoid feeling like someone was watching me, someone who didn't exactly have the best of intentions. I run around the house making sure all the doors and windows are locked as a precaution, all before keeping their cordless phone as close as possible so that, if it came to it, I could call the cops. I was sure I had seen someone, but the chances of them just vacating the area at the sight of flashing lights then returning later could be a huge possibility and a terrifying one at that. So I decided to shoot my shot only when it would be absolutely necessary appearing to waste police time would not be doing me any favors. I suppose I'm just trying to explain why I didn't call the cops right away. I've had friends of mine say that they have just called 911 right then and there, but I wasn't 100% sure of anything right then. I'd seen a shape, not Michael Myers pointing a knife at me. Life isn't black and white most of the time, I was thinking. Anyway, I've secured all the windows and doors shoved the cordless phone into my hoodie's front pouch and have even positioned a little league bat near the couch so that I was sort of armed. So by that point I started to feel relatively safe again. 
If there was some creeper lurking outside looking to prey on a teenage babysitter, they would get one heck of a rude awakening when I waved my bat at them and screamed that the cops were on the way. So I lie back on the couch but naturally find myself unable to relax. I open the curtains back up so I can see if anyone is hanging around in the front yard, keeping my eyes on the windows every so often in between watching whatever social train wreck is on TLC. Nothing happens for a while and I start to think it was all just in my head or something. Right about the time I get up to wander into the kitchen to grab a drink of water. As I'm in there, I get that intense feeling that I'm being watched. I turn to see that same dark shape in the kitchen window, only this time I rush into action. I hammer 911 into the phone, telling the dispatcher I need the cops to my address ASAP, that there's a home invasion in progress. I honestly don't know if it was the adrenaline or I was just sick of pervs thinking they can get away with stuff like that, but I just sort of charged. After screaming out that the cops were on their way, I ran into the TV room, grabbing the Little League bat and just ran for the back door which led out of the kitchen and into the backyard. What happened next is frankly astounding. As I ran at the guy, baseball bat in hand, ready to bash his brains out right there in the yard, I recognized him instantly. It was a face I'd seen before, not long ago at all. It was the kid's dad. So long story short, the dad of the kid I'd been babysitting had, for whatever reason, decided he needed to see what kind of babysitter I was. So apparently he drove his wife to whatever party they were headed to, turned back saying he'd forgotten something, then decided to watch me over the course of about an hour or two to see if I was worth the cash that they were spending. Obviously, since no crime was actually committed, there was no one to charge. The dad offered me a sincere apology, he even offered me double the cash just to finish the night up, but I refused. No amount of money could have persuaded me to stay, and needless to say, I was very selective with who I babysat after that. I've never been a babysitter unless you count looking after my little brother on the odd occasion, but I do have a babysitter story for you all. This all happened back when I was about 10 or 11, as it was the last year of primary school for me and I remember being really excited about going to big school as my mom and dad phrased it. They were off to some work function and I needed a babysitter. I distinctly remember them being worried that they wouldn't be able to go as I think they left it quite late and were worried that they wouldn't be able to find a sitter. I didn't want to be left alone with a stranger, so I remember being absolutely gutted when they said they'd managed to find someone to stay for a few hours on a Saturday evening. But when the time came and the babysitter arrived, I remember thinking that it wouldn't be so bad. She was very pretty and seemed genuinely lovely. Some university student called Sarah, I can't quite remember, but... She pretty much won my parents over in the first few minutes, and well, since they liked her so much, I kind of liked her too. She told me we'd have a little slumber party, that we could watch my favorite film, and my parents sweetened the deal by saying that they'd leave us money for some pizza. So, I really did perk up for a bit as they showed the girl around the house and actually warmed up to the idea as they left the house, and Sarah, who will just call her now for the story's sake, she began to order us pizza. Only, that's when things started to get a bit weird. She asked me what my favorite topping was, in a voice that didn't sound nearly as jolly as before. When I told her I liked pepperoni the most, still my favorite, she just laughed and told me she was a vegetarian. I tried to tell her we could always get two smaller pizzas, but she just ignored me as she placed an order for a large spicy veggie one. I hated spice, and I still do. I can't handle chilies for the life of me, even as a grown-up, so the younger me was absolutely heartbroken that I'd been pretty much shut out of the pizza party that we were supposed to be throwing. And it all went downhill from there. There was a knock at the door a little while after she called, and I suspected it was the delivery guy, but it wasn't. From the top of the stairs, I watched as some lad in his own clothes stepped out of the cold and into our hallway. I was confused as to what was going on, where the pizza was and all that, but when the pair of them started sharing this really horrible wet kiss, 
I got onto the fact that it was obviously her boyfriend or something. And this is all after hearing my parents make it clear to her that she wasn't allowed any company around. So I was really bloody annoyed at this point, like, furious. So I snuck down into the kitchen to try and find the house phone to call my mom. Only it wasn't in the charger. I trot around for a wee bit trying to find the thing when I realize there's a good chance the babysitter had it with her. I walk down the hall to the living room where she and her boyfriend were, open the door, and pretty much recoil at what I see. They're doing stuff, right there on the couch. Sarah screams at me to get out and shuts the door, and I respond with asking her for the phone. She doesn't even acknowledge my request, gets up from the couch with fury in her eyes and slams the door on me before screaming through the wood to get back up to my room and be quiet. I told her I was hungry, but again, absolutely no acknowledgement. So I went back up to my room and just bawled my eyes out. So it's pretty important to remember that this was like the mid-90s, back when the internet or mobile phones weren't exactly available or affordable for a family like mine. If this had happened nowadays, it would be a piece of pie to just phone my parents or, hey, even take a photo of the boyfriend being there and that would be that. But I just didn't have those options available to me and even if I had, this girl was so conniving that she'd probably have found a way around it. But that sort of maltreatment wasn't what scared me. Yeah, it was upsetting, but another danger became more of a priority when I realized that they had trapped the family dog inside the living room with them. I went back downstairs facing my fears and hoping I could at least get Jazz out of the room with them. She was an Australian Shepherd, one of those dogs that's dead shaggy but also looks like someone spilled a can of paint over them or something. I loved her so, so much and I had to rescue her. So I knock on the living room door, only to get told to go away. I knock again, telling the babysitter that it was important that Jazz had to go outside to have a wee or for her to be taken on a walk so she could do a number two. Again, she barked at me to go away. I wasn't about to let this happen to my best friend in the world though, so I push the door open just in time to see the boyfriend do something frankly unbelievable. So in England, we play cricket, don't we? And the balls are insanely hard. Like, I think they might be even harder than baseballs you Americans play with. Solid cork on the inside with a tough leather binding. People actually died from getting hit on the head with cricket balls. Jazz loved her cricket ball. We tried throwing tennis balls and stuff for her, but I think she just liked that leather smell the cricket ball gave off. Maybe it reminded her of actually chasing an animal or something. I don't know. But either way... I opened the door of the living room to find the boyfriend of the sitter just lashing the cricket ball at Jazz. So hard that when it hit her back leg, she yelped, all high-pitched. I tried to run in to rescue her, to pull her into my room where she could be safe, but the boyfriend was fast. He pushed me back into the hallway, shut the door, and then I'm certain he wedged something against it, because I couldn't open it at all from then on. I went up to my room and cried myself to sleep, only waking up to hear my parents talking to the sitter when they got home. I didn't make a sound, I was just too scared. For some reason I had it in my head that the boyfriend would hurt them. I don't know, kids are daft like that I suppose, but of course he wasn't there. He left before my mom and dad got home. I think the real nightmare was that the sitter had actually spun some pure sob story about how I'd been really bad and terribly behaved all evening, how I'd been a brat and demanded this, that, and the other, and they made a huge bloody mistake, the absolute wankers, because that cricket ball had left a huge welt on Jazz's hind leg, and when my dad found out that, I'd at least been partially telling the truth about what they'd been up to, and God... You should have seen how livid he was. I won't bore you with the petty details, but let's just say that that sitter and her boyfriend ended up actually getting arrested on animal cruelty charges, and I know for a fact that he ended up getting convicted and fined for it. So, I suppose a silver lining to a truly terrible night, but be careful who you're hiring to sit your kids, people. <laughs>